everybody. Welcome to the morning show. We're coming to you today on WJOPLP New Report at FM 96.3 on Channel 9 and on New Report Community Media's YouTube channel at ncmhub.org. I'm your host, Mary Jacobson, and I'm delighted this morning to welcome Professor Adam Latz. Adam is a professor of education and history at Binghamton University in New York. He's the author of several books, including Creationism USA, Bridging the Impasse and Teaching Evolution, which came out in 2020. Adam was one of three people nationwide selected for a 2022 Friend of Darwin Award by the National Center for Science Education, which are presented annually to a select few who demonstrate outstanding efforts to advance the goal of defending and supporting the teaching of evolution. Adam is an expert on cultural battles on schooling and school reform, which is what he's here to talk with us about today. So Adam, first of all, welcome, and thank you so much for making time to visit us on The Morning Show. Thanks, thanks, it's my pleasure. And if I could just add one thing uh, to the, thank you for that kind introduction. I also was a teacher for a long time, uh, middle school and high school for 10 years. So um, uh, part of my interest in these issues is having uh, tried to do my best to teach history uh, to kids uh, and to to wrestle with the reasons why it sometimes is much harder than it it needs to be. Which I'm sure gives you just an important context and background for dealing with these issues. Um, And uh, we'll have you draw upon that as we have our interview today, I'm sure, Adam. Well, Adam, earlier this year, famously, the governor of Florida stirred up, uh, I guess, firestorm (laughs) of controversy is the right way, when he blocked the first draft of an advanced place in African-American studies course offered by the College Board. And then a national debate ensued about political efforts by right-wing politicians to control the narrative of Black history. It's always appeared to me that the truth, no matter how inconvenient it is, really does set us free. And it's the path to freedom and growth for individuals and nations. And secrets and lies, on the other hand, are the path to moral and emotional disasters for individuals, communities, and for nations. So choosing consciously to distort history and to paper over the fact-based, grittier chapters is hard for me to fully fathom. Um, I had the good fortune to hear you interviewed on NPR after the AP course controversy erupted, and also to read an excellent piece that you wrote Uh, for the Washington Post. And I've been looking forward to talking with you about this ever since. So let's start at the beginning. Adam, first of all, why are politicians taking it upon themselves to muck about with African-American history and why right now? Mm. Well, I think the, 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 the why is, is sadly um, evident and, and, you know, I don't think um, there's much that even, even someone like Governor Ron DeSantis would disagree with Uh, the, the politics of schooling um, this kind of politics are are cheap and easy. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's not, and it's not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't think we just have to talk about one person. So if we look at last uh, t- two years ago's governor race in Florida, you have candidate Glenn Youngkin who's able to win at least in part by promising to stop something that didn't exist. He, he campaigned at least in part. Uh, on banning critical race theory from Virginia's K-12 schools. So politically, at least in part, the the the, the calculus is depressingly um, appealing and obvious. If you can get uh, electoral support for doing for saying something that you don't actually have to do anything, mm-hmm. it, it's uh, sadly, it's electoral gold. Uh, if you can say that you are standing up, against the people who are pushing pornography into schools, you get all the benefit of saying that you're against pornography in schools without having to do anything because there are a grand total of zero people yeah. who are pushing <laughs> pornography into school libraries. Yeah. So the, the, the right now part, um, or the, the why politicians do it part is, um, I think uh, uh, you don't have to be cynical to, to recognize that this is the, the most obvious sort of electoral calculation. The right now part, I think, is a little trickier, and I think, the, to me at least, the best way to understand it is that, that these kind of politics, you know, these um, uh, appealing to uh, supposedly threatened children in schools, th- the best analogy is that it, it, it's, it's, it's not just right now, it's, it's 100 years. Uh, so the United States has been 
wrapped up in this very similar fight for uh, 100 years uh, in terms of the definition of the two sort of sides. People like yourself and me who say the, the best thing to do is to expose this history to students so that they can understand the past and we can learn from it. We can have honest, difficult conversations about it. Uh, has been one side of it for a hundred years. The other side is that no, if you love America, you wouldn't talk badly about it. If you love America, you would want children to be taught that America is the best. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think the the right now part is um, is a little tricky because this is just the latest outburst yeah. of the hundred year conflict. Well. Um... You know, Adam, one of the things, one of the true and accurate and helpful aspects of history that I learned from you in the article that I read in the Washington Post is, in fact, what you were just uh, referring to, that the roots of these efforts, uh, especially applied to Black history, to uh, erase or distort parts of it, they go back even more than 100 years back to immediately after the Civil War. Um, could you talk about the motives of those efforts after the Civil War and how they're similar to or different from the kind of political expediency and jingoism that you just described? Uh, sure, absolutely. The um, the I think the difficult question behind you know what we teach children about the United States is past. The real question is who are we? You know who, uh, or maybe a little more complicated way to put it, but a little clearer is. Who is the we uh, yeah. in American history? Who counts as us and yeah. who counts as them? Yeah. Um, and uh, sadly, uh, but but clearly for uh, most of U.S. history, the people with the power to define the, the in-group in American history have been white. Um, and we could keep going. White, heterosexual, Christian uh, men. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of defining who the main character gets to be in American history uh, has been um, a defense of, of the main story uh, being one of uh, white America heroically expanding. Um, and there have always been uh, people who push back against that because it's so patently uh, inadequate. You know, the idea that all of America is the story of one group is just obviously in such conflict with with you know basic historical facts that it ends up being you know we might think of it as the creationism of history. Uh, the the facts of the story are not really in dispute. N no one um, you know Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, they would not have disputed that white Christian men were the only people that mattered uh, or the only people in American society. And yet a certain vision of a certain definition of who counts as the real we, the real Americans, uh, has always been super contentious. Yeah, that's, um, you know, interestingly put, I, I think about the phrase we the people <laughs> and what you're saying is we the people in the minds of, uh, of, of many over the course of our history back to the founding fathers has really been not a diverse group. <laughs> it's been, we might call them the American oligarchs, uh, I suppose. Uh, of course, originally, you know, white male property owners. Um, and today, um, I don't know how far it's expanded past that, <laughs> really, um, Adam. Um, but one of the things I read about in your article was an exception to that. There was a history book you talk about, David Muzzy's book, an American history that came out in 1917. And it included a chapter, sounds to me accurately titled, Horrors of the Slave Trade, that sounded like it was a prefigured, the 1619 project. And so um, what happened when that book came out? Which groups tried to ban or block it? And, and was it there, you know, how did they try to justify it? Was it the appeal to patriotism? Um, and the need to protect it that you were just describing, or was it that and other things as well? Yeah, the, the, the story of the Muzzy book is, is really helpful to understand all of what we're seeing in, in headlines these days. Um, the, first of all, because, as you say, the, 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 it, the Muzzy book was not some sort of, you know, uh, a little known alternative textbook. It was the most popular history textbook 
um, in American high schools. Uh, so it was the leading textbook, um, and it came out of academic history that called the, the name for the kind of school of thought was the progressive school. Writers like Charles Beard, uh, Mary Beard were were that, that would, this was the name that they understood themselves as as questioning the sort of um, way that that the United States was founded. Um, and the the protests against Muzzy's book were uh, very widespread. There were specific groups whose names we're familiar with, like the Ku Klux Klan, yeah. uh, which was very large and and um, uh, spread widespread in the in the 1920s. You know, controlling the governments of states like Indiana and Oregon. So uh, a very um, uh, popular or you know widespread group. They protested in ways that that sound familiar. They said that if students were to read that, um, say, for example, the Boston uh, Massacre uh, in 1770, one of the sparks of the United yeah. States Revolution, in his earliest uh, drafts, the David Muzzy history talked about a mob. That was the word that was very provocative to a lot of um, conservative, uh, they called themselves patriots, uh, uh, groups like the, the Ku Klux Klan and the Daughters of the American Revolution. They thought that if you referred to um, the, the people who ended up fighting against British uh, domination, if you referred to them as a mob, mm -hmm. which again, in terms of like academic accuracy, there's no doubt that what happened in Boston was certainly done, led by what, you know, groups of people without clear leaders acting violently, you know, that's a mob. Yeah. By uh, definition. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't just, though, groups that we think of as extreme. It was state legislatures. So, for example, um, several states, New Jersey, New York, uh, they um, passed resolutions saying that uh, a book, a textbook specifically, not just a book, but a, a book for children that gave children um, a sense that the the founders of the United States were anything but but sort of mythic heroes. The the language, I think, is telling. The, the state legislature in New Jersey, for example, uh, talked about this as a, as a harm, as a poison mm. for young minds. Mm. Uh, the, the worry was that if children read this fact, and, and, and whether it was true or not, if children read this fact, it would turn them against their country. It would make them unable to be patriots. Um, and it would it would cause real harm, not just to the individual children, which they thought it would, but to the United States. Um, mm -hmm. Groups uh, like in the New Jersey legislature just assumed that children needed to hear a heroic history in order to be formed as, as good citizens. Mm -hmm. Now, the denouement is even sadder. It wasn't that the book was was just sort of banned, although people wanted to ban it. Uh, even worse, it's more subtle than that. The publisher changed it. Mm. By the 1920s, the Muzzy story, or sorry, the, the, tech, the story in the Muzzy textbook got rid of language that was con controversial, uh, not because it wasn't true, but because it was provocative. So for example, the word mob was replaced uh, and instead, you know, words um, that were less uh, pointed. So groups, yeah. Um, you know, squads, you know, like I don't, I don't know the exact words yeah. offhand, but uh, the Muzzy changed the language, or the, I should say the publisher changed the language of the textbook to maintain sales of a very popular and lucrative book, but to take out things, not because they weren't true, but because they were upsetting to people who wanted a certain type of history. Yeah, because some people found them threatening and defined them as dangerous. Um so, um, well, you know, following up on, on what you've been saying, you also, you, you've referenced that the 20s was a time of tremendous resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, not just in the South, but everywhere in the country. And um, they also helped to spawn efforts, not just to ban or bowdlerize certain books like David Muzzy's, but to create their own textbooks, to create alternative histories, um, one thinks of Kellyanne Conway's famous phrase, alternative facts, um, within that um, context. 
So could you tell us about a famous example of that that you discuss um, in your article when the American Legion commissioned a textbook with, I think he was a a CUNY professor, Charles Horn. Mm -hmm. Um, So he came up with his alternative history. Um, Could you tell us uh, how that history was different, perhaps from a fact-based history and how it was received at the time? Sure. Yeah, I I think it's a good example. The Horn textbook is a good example of one of the... um, one of the defining elements of a certain type of, uh, we could call it like a make make America great again vision. Uh, And back in the 1920s, the Horn textbook went through all the processes that a textbook would go through. It had readers, it had feedback. They went out and they solicited uh, uh, blurbs from as influential people as they could. Um, And everything looked great. Um, Again, to, to repeat this, it was a project commissioned by the American Legion which had a, a very conservative Americanism commission. That's what they called it. Uh-huh. But it was supported by groups like the Ku Klux Klan, the Daughters of the American Revolution, uh, these groups that considered themselves, uh, what they, they called themselves patriotic organizations. Uh, but they really were, you know, I think our best uh, label might be, you know, make America great organizations. Mm-hmm. And the, the process, uh, I think, tells a lot about how the worldview survives so long and so uh, uh, imperviously to criticism. As as the book went through the process, it was given laudatory uh, reviews by people like, um, uh, uh, for example, the governor of Oregon, Walter Pierce, who the Klan put into office. And he wrote, he said, finally, this is the textbook America has needed. This is the textbook. The, 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 the thing that people praised about it was that finally you had a textbook that um, told the story of America as a heroic quest um, yeah. by white uh, men to spread civilization, you know, across the the, the nation. Um, the the as soon as the book got out of this charmed circle of people who already were in agreement with its argument, as soon as it left that sort of you know room of funhouse distorted mirrors. It 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 just fell apart as the mm. as the empty bad history it was. Mm. Uh, so, for example, reviews uh, in in uh, magazines like Harper's and the Atlantic, they they the reviewers just were sort of sputtering about it's it, it it's it's riddled with inaccuracies like basic inaccuracies, uh, you know, years, dates, names, that kind of thing. Uh, but then you know the language that kept coming up in the reviews from from out from people who weren't weren't conservatives. They were just, you know, they were outraged at the at the way this presented the language of the twenties. They called it bigoted. They called it chauvinistic. They called it um, hostile to any immigrant. They called it hostile to anybody who wasn't white. Uh, and they said it's just a, a screed of self-serving inaccuracy. So as soon as it escaped from the circle that had wanted to believe it, it immediately fell apart. Yeah. And even the American Legion backed away and said. We we didn't we can't support it. Uh, it's so bad, not just because of the politics, but just because it was bad. The <laughs> facts are wrong all up and down. So yeah. I think it's a, a, a case in point for how outrageous stories that only circulate in a certain world can grow. Uh, and, and then hopefully, as soon as they le- are forced out of that world, as soon as hard questions are asked. Yeah they fall apart. That's what happened with the Horn textbook. Yeah. Um, To use a phrase we use today, um, outside the information bubble, uh, once the bubble exploded, it it fell apart. The center couldn't hold because it was based on, you know, lies and distortions. Um, You know, speaking about the the Horn book, there was something else I wanted to ask you. Um, You know, I I went to um, seventh grade in Virginia, where I grew up. My family had moved there from Michigan. And this was back in the 60s. And the Virginia history textbook that we use was one of the ones that was actually featured in the 1619 project. I recognized the cover of it distinctly. And um, coming there from the, you know, from a different state and encountering Virginia's history um, at the time, I was um, stunned at how they described slavery. They mm-hmm. talked about it as, oh, it wasn't so bad. You know, the owners were very kind and took really good care. 
And and my response, even as a 12 year old was what nonsense, <laughs> no one wants to be owned by somebody else. <laughs> you know, there's no kindness in that. <laughs> and and so when I read, read some of you, you quoted some of the things that um, Charles Horn actually says in his history book. And I want to quote some of them and then ask you what you make of them. Um, he said, slavery was a benefit for Africans and a burden for white leaders. And he said also that the blight of slavery fell less upon their race than on their masters. Now, what kind of mind, how do you understand? Um, Cause you've read a lot of this <laughs> material, Adam. How do you understand the mindset of somebody who can set pen to paper and write that and presumably it's what they think? Well, yeah, and, and, and um, uh, uh, unfortunately, the attitude that um, uh, the slave system was a benefit for enslaved people yeah. was very widespread and popular south, as you mentioned, in textbooks in Virginia up through the 1960s. But even in the northern part of the United States, not I don't I wouldn't say through the 1960s. But, you know, if you went to Harvard in the 19 teens and you learned about what happened after the Civil War, you would have been taught uh, that the after the Civil War, um, it was luckily um, the, the former pre-war white elites were able to come back and take over charge. They were able to redeem mm -hmm. their states. You would be taught at places like Harvard in the 19 teens that black leadership after the war was a mess because they were uh, black people were unable to handle political power. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, yeah, it is, um, it is certainly regional. Uh, you know, the, the schools in the South K-12 schools in the South maintained this myth of, uh, of, of a slave system that was benevolent of a slave system that was a benefit for enslaved people. The, 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 the story goes like this. Uh, the story assumes, and, and I'm sorry, but to, because it's such a, 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 a profoundly racist vision of the whole yeah. world and history. But the story goes that Africa is, the language was, you know, a savage place, a dark yeah. place, a benighted place. So that by pulling people from there, you were, and introducing them to things like uh, Christianity, hard work, yeah. uh, religion, uh, I'm sorry, uh, literacy, you were you know, American slave owners were um, saving Africans and African Americans. So, you know, as as twelve year old you and and certainly uh, historians, it doesn't it doesn't um, it doesn't make any sense on the face of no. it. Uh, and and I mean, absolutely, uh, it doesn't match the historical record at all. Yeah. Uh, and yet it's it is a story, I think, uh, because it is um, it's a sort of, you know, psychological necessity. Mm -hmm. uh, if Americans are trying to ask if the battles about history are who are we? One of the answers has to be if you want to maintain a quite an idea that America is a special kind of morally good place. Mm -hmm. You need to explain to everyone, including 12 year olds in Virginia. If it's a morally good place, why did the, why was the country built uh, on the labor of enslaved people and on the genocide of indigenous people? Yeah, you know those are big, big problems uh, that need to be explained if we can if if the the goal is to maintain a heroic history. And I think one of the ways to do it is to say that well, actually, I, I you know slavery was a benefit. It was something that that white people did, uh, Americans did to help um, enslaved people. And again, the, the falseness or trueness is almost beside the point because it's so patently false. Mm -hmm. I think the way to understand it is to say, uh, in order to tell a heroic story of America, you need to explain these gross, unheroic episodes that are obvious to even the, the most, uh, you know, not interested child. You can't ignore these these basic facts of where the United States uh, came from, the story of the sort of um, benefit of slavery is what it fits into there. And if we can extend it, it's the same with the benef the the story uh, of the the last Indian. You know, mm -hmm. so in order for genocide to make sense in a heroic history, the Indian population had to have been on the way out. 
uh, and had to have been sort of inevitably ready to be displaced for for the for the genocide and the displacement to yeah. make moral sense. So I think it's all of a piece. That if you yeah. want to tell a story of a heroic America, you can't avoid the the two big obvious problems: slavery and genocide. Well, that's really fascinating, Adam. And creating that context helps connect the dots. Um, and the the motive is, but it requires a singular lack of imagination and empathy. I, I have to say, <laughs> you know, to advance this narrative, um, and a singular extraordinary cosmic level of self interest, <laughs> you know, to advance it. But part of what it rests on is this idea that American patriotism is threatened. If you tell the real truth, if you teach the fact-based gritty history, um, uh, whether it's what happened to indigenous peoples or whether it's uh, about slavery, that um, that um, that young people, Americans, I guess, in general, just I always think of the Jack Nicholson line in A Few Good Men, that they just can't handle the truth, um, that it would be damaging and dangerous, and I don't know, patriotism would fall apart. Um, uh, somehow those ideas are there. And that's presented, as you just were describing it very eloquently, Adam, as the reason. Um, do you feel like that is the authentic reason, or are there other motivations, perhaps deeper, darker ones beneath the surface that perhaps help us understand why this narrative is so important uh, to be advanced? Yeah, the, the, the analogy that works the best for me uh, in order to understand um, why first the level of uh danger that some conservatives perceive when they think about children hearing the 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 uh, acknowledged truths of of US history uh, per, you know the way that that the strength with which people feel that this is dangerous but then also the the idea that it, it is dangerous for children to acknowledge the truth uh, the analogy that works for me is if we think of you know these school wars are sort of like a big extended family dinner you know, where everyone gets together, the tensions, we all know what the tensions are in the family. Uh, you know, uh, one of the brothers, uh, one of the siblings has never been, has never felt like they've been included. And in fact, they haven't, uh, you know, all the, uh, uh, what are we supposed to do with different members of the family who have different politics? How do we get through a polite dinner? The history part, to me, the analogy is at the end of the night, and again, this may, might not make sense for every family, but uh, depending on your family. At the end of the night, the sort of adult siblings sit around um, with a, a drink um, and they one of the siblings says, hey, look it, we need, we need to talk about mom's drinking problem. And another sibling says, stop, I love mom. Yeah. It's like, no, we all love mom. The, 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 the division is not whether we love mom or don't love mom. But one side is saying, if you talk about this, you don't love our, you know, our parent or our, our ancestors. The, 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 the problem, though, is that if you don't talk about the problem, um, it not only does it not go away, but it only gets worse. So yeah. not discussing the basic history of the United States, the basic facts of the history, not only does it um, leave the problem unaddressed, it makes the problem worse because it leaves people with a feeling like they know a history that is not just untrue, but is truly damaging. You know, yeah. so if people grow up thinking that, uh, you know, basically uh, racism was in the past mm -hmm. and it's not an issue anymore, then they are subject to believing that policies to address racism, um, affirmative action, reparation, that, that those are somehow unfair. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, it's actually white people who are the victim, the thinking goes, uh, because the history has been so woefully covered over, misunderstood and then misrepresented. Uh, so to me, the analogy, when I want to understand it, it, it's as personal as your as your mom. Mm -hmm. You know, it's as personal as defending your family. Uh, and it's as important as defining and understanding who your family is, what the problems are and setting up an actual process to handle these or not bearing the problems, pretending that there were no problems, and in fact, lying about the problems to the children. Yeah, I think that's a perfect analogy, actually, Adam. And an, another way to put it is that 
people within the family um, have different ways of defining what loyalty and love are. Mm -hmm. And for some people, loyalty means denying something they think will be uncomfortable for mom to hear. And for other people, love and loyalty mean, no, we have to be honest or mom won't get the help she needs. She'll keep drinking and she may well drink herself to death, you know, and we need an intervention. Uh, we need to be honest here. We need to overcome denial uh, about what's really going on. And we need to be brave and strong and courageous to do that. And that's a factor as well for individuals, I think. You have to find the courage within yourself to confront the truth and whatever it means for you and whatever adjustments you need to make in encountering reality as it is, and human beings as they are, in all our mixed qualities. Um, so I think that was a great analogy. Thank you very much for that. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you in light of, you know, who can handle the truth is you were a teacher, as you started out telling us, you were a teacher um, uh, in Milwaukee uh, for, for, I think it was 10 years. And so you have up close and personal experience with what children can handle. <laughs> In your experience, Adam, you know, can young people handle the truth? And are they good at detecting cover-ups or confabulations um, in history when they're told? Yeah, it's such a vital question that, that we don't ask often enough. You know, we talk about, or the, the headlines talk about parents' rights, politicians talk about parents' rights. We need to think about children's rights. Uh, you know, I think the, the, the thing that makes the most sense is to ask again and again, um, what about children's rights to learn the best available information? Not just parents' rights to have their child only hear certain things, but children's rights to hear these um, this information that academically, expert-wise, it's not controversial among in that sense. Uh, so, one hundred percent, absolutely, uh, young people are um, keenly attuned to the fact, at least by high school age. They're keenly attuned to the fact that everything is not what it seems. And that um, in, I know we, people attack young people as like, you know, being addicted to their phones and sort of, you know, just following TikTok blindly. Uh, if you hang around with high school age people, it's just patently untrue. Uh, they, they keenly recognize um, smoke screens. Uh, and in, in general, sadly, a lot of the apathy that, that tends to dominate a lot of high school history classes uh, isn't because students aren't interested in the past. It's because they've figured out that what high school has to tell them tends to be a sort of mishmash in the middle, you know, a sort of both sides are OK. Uh, the truth is mysterious. You know, like here's the story that, that the state has approved for you to hear. As opposed to here's the truth, the way it is and the way it makes sense to you as someone who understands a thing or two about um, life. Uh, you know, so for for students, I think the biggest danger is that they tune out. Uh, they're tempted to tune out school history because they they know that textbooks go through all these processes to be approved, to be recognized, to be a sort of acceptable story um, instead of being uh the the truth uh, as it as it is in in their real lives you know the, yeah. the truth and all uh, warts and all the way they know things to be true so mm -hmm. do i think students uh, can handle the truth well absolutely um but i think even more strongly uh the process by which school history tends to be selected which is nothing too controversial but rather a middle of the road story uh, it's calculated to uh, not, not, I don't mean a grand conspiracy. I mean, the, the process ends up with students tuning out school history as being sort of, um, you know, uh, watered down, which unfortunately, in too many cases, it really is. Well, that's really um, interesting, Adam, because um, what you might say then, in addition to the, the great way that you've put it is instead of somehow an altered or a watered down history creating super patriotic children, that it creates less engaged children who don't necessarily trust the narrative um, that they're being told. And it would be natural for all of us, if we don't trust the narrative we're being told, we're likely to tune out much of it. And it can also, I would think, promote a certain amount of cynicism um, about education. And at the time when 
to me, and I suspect you'd agree with this, we need more people to study history. <laughs> because as a friend of mine once put it, history is hope, <laughs> but that would be authentic history, true history. Um, you know, unfortunately, the response of many young people to watered down versions of history is they can tell that it's not the full story and it's less engaging. Uh, I, I think they, uh, as you were pointing out, they, um, they could handle the truth that they were given it, but they can often tell when a story lacks um, grit and narrative detail. Um, and it feels more like, um, I don't know, uh, a Hallmark movie, a Hallmark, I don't know, a version of history, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it has kind of like the opposite effect, perhaps, to um, some of the way that some of the supporters of a watered down history might justify it. Have I understood you? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would just extend it to say the, the danger is that if, if school history, uh, students and, and uh, humans in general, we can't not be full of history. You know, it's how we understand who we are as people. You know, we are our pasts, both as people, you know, and our families, but then our communities and our towns and our countries and our, our religions and our race and how we identify, all of those understandings are historical. So if students aren't getting um, a, a history in school that that matches the way they understand humans to be, which by age 15, 16, 17, that's how people are thinking. They're noticing the way humans really act. If school history seems fake, it's not that students will then move forward not knowing anything. They will turn to more satisfying explanations of how they came to be, uh, which can be really even more poisonous than the things that are coming out of conservative politicians. They'll turn to voices on the internet yeah. who are uh, frankly misogynistic, frankly explicitly racist, white supremacists, yeah. and they, they but they talk in um, a language that can feel more authentic to a student who who knows that the story that the textbook is saying is kind of bland and leaving some stuff out. When people on uh, different social media platforms speak more sort of aggressively and uh, angrily that can strike students as more authentic. Uh, so not only are we leaving students bored, apathetic, and like uninterested in school history, we're leaving them vulnerable to, uh, you know, uh, frankly untrue, in, yeah. you know, sometimes intentionally untrue uh, historical visions that appeal for other reasons besides, yeah. you know, academic uh, accuracy. The loudest voices can galvanize their attention. Um, so, I, I, but I, I have to say, Adam, that's also why I'm glad that you're doing the work that you do, um, because I think that context is what's needed uh, for people to connect the dots. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> so, well, And if I could, oh, sorry to interrupt, but, and also so many of our history teachers are doing my job now, I get to yeah. work with history teachers, you know, all over this area, but then also in, in you know, with organizations like Gilder Lerman in New York, all over the country, um, and history teachers not only want to do a good job, they are doing a good job. And Gallup polls show it over and over. Parents who are nervous about America's schools, they love their kids' schools and their kids' teachers. So uh, history teachers are doing this. It's just heartbreaking to see uh, some politicians going for easy votes yeah. by making the job harder. Uh, yeah. When so many students want it, teachers want it, families want it. But as you mentioned, the loudest voices sometimes seem not to want it, and that can um, uh, damp down uh, yeah. the, the teacher's ability to do what our job is. It, it can um, overwhelm um, the public narrative, whereas the good news is what you were just describing, that the Gallup poll is showing that, you know, in terms of parents saying, I like my kid's teacher, you know, I think they're getting a good education. But it's hard to uh, grab attention um, when you're not yelling, <laughs> when you're just doing the important and the noble work, in, in my opinion, of um, teaching kids well and truly, which will engage them and hopefully turn them into lifelong learners of history. What could be a better outcome than that? <laughs> so, um, Adam, I have just a couple more questions for you, because I, I'm confident you'll have a good answer for what I want to ask you next. I'm eager to hear what you'll say in your view what role does a full and honest history play in the kind of people that we become as individual human beings and, and as a nation state? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in my view, but, but I also will say it's the view of uh, people who study 
uh, societies and how societies can um, uh, heal and recover from troubled histories. You know, it's it's really difficult. This is the sort of, you know, I, we need to talk about mom's drinking problem analogy. Yeah. It is very difficult for a lot of Americans of all political backgrounds to think of uh, American history in terms that they're familiar with from places like Rwanda, uh, where there are um, genocides of one group by another, atrocities against uh, minority groups by the group in power. For a lot of Americans, and again, across the political spectrum, for a lot of Americans, those terms seem um, sort of alarmist or excessive uh, or extreme to talk about American history that way. I, I think historians and history teachers um, feel differently. Uh, you just can't uh, look at American history without being, um, you know, struck by the 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 ways that not just violence, not just individual violence or crime, but you know, historical atrocity has played in forming uh, the past in the, the way our our our. Um, our society, the United States was was created. So luckily, um, scholars have done a lot to study how past trauma like that needs to be uh, dealt with. Mm -hmm. And it's not too dissimilar from the way a family would need to deal with a family history. Uh, it needs to be, first of all, acknowledged. And second of all, it needs to be addressed in a way that all groups can agree not just um, acknowledges the past, but also addresses legitimate grievances. Yeah. Um, so, for example, you know, as a teacher, sometimes students don't like to hear, you know, that 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 um, you know that the United States not just had problems in the past, but has problems in the in the present that are a part of that past, and the the um, the statistics are just. Once you look at them, you can't look away. So, for example, when you look at with, for students, when students look at questions like, um, uh, I know this sounds like it's off topic, but it really is on topic. I swear. Uh, when they look at things like maternity, uh, maternal mat uh, mortality rates in the United States, and and you know, again, this is not um, politics or ideology. These are numbers that I think people can agree on is accurate. It's just striking that the maternal mortality, so, you know, after you have a baby, how dangerous is that for you? If you're Black or Indigenous, non-white, it's physically more dangerous for you to have a baby in the United States yeah. now, not just in the yeah. period of enslavement, not just during Cherokee removal in the 1830s, but now. Uh, and I think, you know, for students seeing that number and wondering about it and saying, it's like, well, is it because they have lower income? And it's like, well, you even when you correct for income, it's still true. Mm -hmm. and I think those numbers um, can do the kinds of things that scholars say societies need to do to address histories of violence and trauma. And mm -hmm. that is acknowledge it, um, recognize that, that, you know, it, it has lasting results then and only then move on to addressing uh, the the you know the the ways to change things in the present that recognize the real um, violence and history of the past. Yeah. So it's a tall order uh, because, as I mentioned, the United States, even people who consider themselves you know politically liberal or progressive, um, they. It's it's an uncomfortable fact to say, well, um, I understand that Americans his, America's history was you know sort of defined by racial hierarchies. Mm -hmm. It's a harder thing though to say that the public school my kid goes to today, in a town that's made up of mostly affluent, mostly white people in a suburb of a city like Boston, it's very difficult for someone to say. The, the fact that my kid goes to a, a, a high quality public school is tied to that history. The fact that the town with our schools in it has, you know, most of the kids go to college, uh, they have very good test scores. Uh, those kinds of basic facts 
of, of society today are tied to the history that is so difficult, not, not just to deal with, but even to acknowledge for some people. So what role does a full and honest history play? A full and honest history is step one of this process. Yeah. Step one of this process is to say, we Americans know that the history of the United States is one in which racial hierarchies and racial violence played a decisive role, not an unfortunate like criminal role. People can acknowledge that, but a central formative role in how things uh, came to be the way they came to be. Things like the constitution, uh, you know, basic facts of American life are rooted in that history. And so what role does a full and honest history play? It is step one. Uh, and I think, you know, step two is deciding on it. Step two is bringing it to children. Uh, and unfortunately, we've been stuck on step one, you know, for a hundred years and more. Yeah, well, I knew you'd have a great answer. <laughs> Adam, and you did. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> that was brilliant and eloquent. And I really appreciate it. And I think the 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 reality is that whether we've been aware of history or not, we live in a country where we all inherit a violent and traumatic past. You can't be in the United States and not be in in the process of inheriting that every day. Um, and if we're not aware of that, um, you know, we won't be able to um, understand what's happening in the world around us. We won't be able to understand our own emotional reactions to things. Um, and we run the danger of simply living in a cloud. And then the danger is that we'll just keep repeating the same kinds of, of, of violence and trauma. Um, because mom never got to get her intervention <laughs> or get and, treatment. And, and, so, and, and the grandkids come in and say, why is grandma yelling at me? Did I do something wrong? Yeah, exactly. And we have no answer. We need exactly. an answer for the kids. Adam, thank you so much. It's really been so enlightening and wonderful. I've really enjoyed talking to you. And, and that's part of the benefit of studying history, too, is it's really a joy to encounter fundamental truths. Um, it really is one of the great gratifications of life to learn things that feel authentic and true. And history does that as well. And you've done that for us today. Adam, I can't thank you enough. I really, really appreciate your time and your eloquence and the research that you've done. So keep at it. <laughs> Have at it, Adam. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking to you. It's been really a privilege and a pleasure. That's it for the morning show today, everybody. Please join us again next Thursday at nine for the morning show. Until then, be well and study history. <laughs> Bye now. Bye, Adam. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you.